Welcome everyone to our first official webinar for the Menopause Charity. Um, I'm Dr Radhika Vora, I'm a GP and a trustee to the Menopause Charity and with me tonight I have Dr Louise Newson who is founder and trustee to the Menopause Charity and Dr Rebecca Lewis. Welcome to both of you. The charity has been established by a group of passionate and um, innovative uh, women's health carers who wanted to start a, a, a initiative that allows women's health to be advocated and healthcare professionals to be able to look to education, support and connection for women with healthcare professionals and for the information they need to live happier and healthier lives. The menopause is a treatable hormone deficiency and every woman should have the opportunity to replace their hormones if they wish and if they've got all the information to be able to help them to do so. The charity is here to ensure that everyone's fully informed and prepared to have the correct information, resources and support to be able to access that information. Throughout this session today, we'll be providing you with the necessary information, resources and support to be able to have that information to be able to get yourself the help you need. The charity also aims to support training for everybody. We're going to be talking with Dr. Louise Newsom first, who'll start the session and follow some education around perimenopause and menopause and the different types of hormone therapy available to you will be spoke by by Rebecca Lewis afterwards. We also have Dr. Sarah Bull, who's a GP with a special interest in menopause, who's at hand to answer your questions and help us. You'll see a Q&A function on the side. Please do feel free to type any questions you have and you can also vote for the questions that stand out to you as we go along. So they will come to the top of our attention as we go along. The session is being recorded. So women who haven't been able to attend today can access that information later on. We suggest you choose speaker view so you're able to see the screens of the speakers in particular. And we're now going to make a start. So. I'll hand over to Louise, who's going to start talking. Thank you so much. Thank you ever so much. So welcome today. It's really lovely to, um, to know that so many people there in front of us. It's a real shame that it's not a person to person um, experience, but I hope you'll come away with a lot of information and knowledge and feel more empowered. So um, as some of you know, I'm Dr. Louise Newson. I'm a GP and menopause specialist, and um, I'm very privileged to have founded the charity. And I really hope this is the start of a very exciting journey for women to really make a difference to women everywhere across the world to improve their health um, and their happiness, actually, during the menopause. So I don't actually have any specific declarations of interest, just to be completely clear. I do not take any money from any pharmaceutical companies and actually the charity, we've all decided that we are not accepting money from pharmaceutical companies, but we will accept donations from anyone else. Um, I'm also a director of a, the largest menopause clinic in the world actually, um, and we see around 1500 women a month in the clinic, uh, soon to increase as we have more doctors working with us. Um, I'm also the director of a not-for-profit company doing research and education in menopause and also the director of the free app Balance um, and obviously the founder of the menopause charity. I do have a small declaration in that I take HRT um, and I'm being very open about this and you'll see why in a minute when I talk a bit further but actually for me it's very important. I think it was an important decision to make because without HRT, I certainly wouldn't have kept my job as a doctor because my brain was really affected and my memory as well. So just in my presentation, I'm going to actually um, unveil or talk about my experience. I'm going to obviously explain what the menopause is. And as Rajika said, as a, um, it's a hormone deficiency with health risks. So I want to talk a bit about the health risks and just ways of how to receive optimal help and treatment. And then Rebecca will talk obviously in detail about HRT and treatment. So this is me five years ago. I was very fortunate. I was um, awarded a fellowship of the Royal College of GPs um, in London. And so this is me with my fancy gown and with my certificate in my hand, feeling quite smug actually, because I was quite young to be awarded a fellow. Um, 
so quite soon after that, I um, started to become unwell and I wasn't sure what was going on. And um, I always wanted to do more menopause work and I started to do some training to become a specialist around this time. Um, and I really wanted to open a clinic in the NHS actually, which I couldn't because there wasn't such thing or there still isn't such thing as a NHS menopause clinic near to where I live. So I started to develop and write content for the menopause doctor website and it was a huge amount of work. If any of you've gone on it, you'll realize how much information is on there. So I was pushing myself hard as well as working as a GP. But I started to get night sweats and also feeling incredibly tired. And I just generally didn't feel myself. Um, as a doctor, we always think something really awful is wrong with us. So I thought maybe I've got a type of cancer or a lymphoma, which is a type of cancer of the blood uh, of the uh, lymph glands, because one of the ways people present with a lymphoma is night sweats. So I said to my husband, who's also a doctor, but I'm not going to go and see anyone because I'm too worried something serious is going on, and I don't want a, 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 a diagnosis at the moment because there's so much other work I want to do. So I ploughed on. But then I was getting some other symptoms. I've had migraines for many years, um, but they were getting a lot worse. They were more frequent and a lot more severe. Um, and they often were triggered, especially at the weekend or when we went away on holiday. And they were really difficult to, to manage, actually. I was also becoming more forgetful. And it is quite amusing when you find your car keys in the fridge. But it's not quite amusing, so amusing when you forget to remind your children that they need to take their games kit to school or their music for a lesson or even forget to take them to an extra club. Um, but more seriously, actually, I was forgetting names of medications, antibiotics, painkillers that I prescribed for many years as a doctor. I could not remember what they were. And so I was really worrying about my capacity and ability to work as a doctor. I was more clumsy. I found that I was walking into cupboards in the kitchen and just had more bruises on my leg, which was a concern. My concentration was affected as well. I found it very difficult to retain information. So then I was thinking, well, I, maybe I haven't got a lymphoma. Maybe I've got a brain tumour. And um, my, my father actually died when I was nine and he had a brain tumour and he presented with headaches. And I was thinking, goodness me, I really don't want history repeating itself. But again, I was too worried to go to a doctor. I was also experiencing some joint pains and muscle stiffness. And um, so some of you might know that I'm, I'm very passionate about doing yoga regularly. And I was finding my yoga practice very um, difficult and not fluid and I wasn't enjoying it. But it didn't really matter so much because my stamina was very low. So then I was thinking, well, have I got fibromyalgia? Have I got chronic fatigue syndrome? Maybe I've got a, a type of arthritis. It's very weird to be feeling like this. I also had very little motivation. I really wanted to do more menopause work. I wanted to try and get more training, but I just couldn't be bothered. My self-esteem was really low. I just felt generally flat, very joyless. Nothing interested me, nothing made me feel happy, but I had no reason to be like this. I was quite emotionally labile and I remember crying once at work um, for no reason really. And the receptionists were quite concerned because it was quite out of character for me. And I've just said I was generally just just existing, really, not really enjoying my life. My sleep was interrupted. I was waking up with night sweats. But even when I wasn't having night sweats, I would just wake in the early hours of the morning, not being able to get back to sleep, which is very frustrating because I knew I'd be tired the next day. My libido was reduced. And I'm, you know, I'm talking about this because lots of people don't talk about libido we're very british and we don't like to always think or talk about sex but actually it is very important and it's very important for relationships so my libido was down so i thought maybe i'm depressed actually but i had no reason to be and i didn't think i was clinically depressed and i didn't think i should really be taking antidepressants I was also very irritable, very short tempered, and I can get a bit feisty at times, but I'm not really a cross, angry person. But it was almost like I had something in my brain telling me to be really nasty. I was very cross with my family, especially my husband. So one day, my daughter, who was uh, 12 at the time, said to me, Mummy, I think you might need your period because some of my friends are like you just before they have their period. And I thought, mm, PMS. But then I realised I actually hadn't had a period for the last four months. Then the penny dropped and I realised what was going on. 
clearly all these symptoms are menopausal symptoms, but they're also perimenopausal symptoms. So they would be the average age really for the perimenopause, skipping periods, getting all these symptoms. I've had a lot of training about the menopause, but I didn't pick it up myself. And it really made me reflect actually how hard it can be for women to make, make a diagnosis themselves. But then also once I made the diagnosis, I actually couldn't get HRT from my GP because they were too scared about the risks. So for a few weeks, I really was in this void where I thought I might be giving up my job. I didn't know what my future was, but I really wanted to stay with my family. But there was a risk of losing them as well because I was so awful to be with. So it, it, I realised first-handedly how difficult it can be for a lot of women, but I was very fortunate because I only had symptoms for a few months. And many women we talk to have symptoms for much longer before getting help. So if we think about the menopause, why is it so important? Why are we talking about it now? Well, in the Victorian times, um, the average age of the menopause is actually older than it is now, about 57. Women didn't live quite as long. The average life expectancy was 59. Obviously, women did live a lot older than that, but a lot of women obviously weren't working. They didn't have the same demands as, as we have now. But now our life expectancy is longer. And it, um, we also know that the average age of the menopause is 51, so a bit earlier. So that means for many women, a third of their lives, or around 30%, they will be postmenopausal. And that means that's a time where they will have no hormones forever. So we have to think about the menopause as a female hormone deficiency syndrome with health risks, which I'll talk about in a minute. So what is the menopause? Everyone's talking about it, but what does it really mean? Well, if we break down the word meno is our menstrual cycle, so our periods, pause obviously means stop. Um, and so it means our periods have stopped. But what's really strange, actually, is it's a look back in time retrospective diagnosis. So it's officially when you haven't had your period for a year. Um, but nothing amazing happens to us at that stage. We don't get a telegram from the Queen or a, a badge to wear. It just means that usually our ovaries have run out of producing eggs, the associated hormones decline, and they'll stay low forever. But some women actually have an induced, so not a natural menopause, and that's if their ovaries are damaged by drugs or radiotherapy, or they're removed. So if someone has both their ovaries removed, they will become menopausal straight away, because without your ovaries, you, you don't have the hormones. And then people who are perimenopausal essentially have the same as the menopausal symptoms, but peri means around the time of, so it means the hormones start to reduce, periods start to change, menopausal symptoms occur, and that can occur for around a decade before um, the menopause actually occurs. So for most women, they start to get symptoms in their 40s, but early menopause is under 45, premature ovarian insufficiency POI is under 40, and I found a one in a hundred women under the age of 40 have a premature ovarian insufficiency. So that means there's a lot of young women who are having perimenopausal symptoms and menopausal symptoms. So it's really important that we don't think of the menopause as a middle-aged condition or an old lady's condition. It can affect people from all ages. And the importance of oestrogen is so, so essential to know because we have cells that respond to oestrogen ev everywhere in our body. There isn't one cell in our body that doesn't respond to oestrogen. And when we know that, that makes us or helps us understand why our symptoms can be so varied and they can affect every system in our body. But it also makes us understand more the health risks as well. So who is affected is a really stupid question, I realise. So all women clearly will become menopausal, but you can argue, and I certainly can, that men indirectly will be affected because men either live with women, work with women, see women, they have women who are relatives. And so they will have some effect by being with these women. So it's really important that everyone knows about it. We know the majority of women will have symptoms and some studies have shown around a quarter of women have severe symptoms, really having a negative effect on them at home or at work. Um, but I think it's probably more than that. A lot of women don't realize their symptoms are menopausal. We know that around half of women don't go and see a doctor and that's partly because if they think, well, it's a natural process. I don't want to medicalize it. 
And this is despite nearly half of women saying their symptoms are actually worse than they thought. But I think this is really important. This is a study I did in West Midlands Police. And the majority of women actually didn't realize their symptoms were due to the menopause until they were given information. And I can completely understand that, knowing how my symptoms were, I didn't realize they were. And I wish someone at work had said to me, Louise, do you think, do you want to download the app, the Balance app, or do you want some more information because it might be related to your hormones? And it would have saved me a few months of having a difficult time. So there's a whole myriad of symptoms that can occur. And in this pictogram, it shows some of them. And this is something we put on the back of the toilet doors when I was working with West Midlands Police. But quite a few ladies came up to me and said, I hate going to the toilet and seeing that woman because I am that meno lady, but I don't know how to get help. And the more I speak to women, the more I liaise with women over social media and through various other platforms, I realise that women are often really struggling without getting the right help. But a lot of women can cope with some symptoms, but it's these symptoms that affect people most. So it's the psychological symptoms, the anxiety, the low mood, just feeling very low, very cheerful. Some women have very, very intrusive dark thoughts. And this is because estrogen is really important in the way our brains work. Um, and this is something that a lot of people don't realize, and even sadly, health professionals, especially psychiatrists, don't understand the power of hormones in our brains. So if that's not depressing enough, it let's think about the risks of health with our menopause. I've already said that estrogen is very important for the way our bodies function. So without it, changes happen in our body. So we get an accelerated bone loss. Our bone is not something that's just a solid structure supporting us. It's actually got very active cells in that build bone and also break that bone down. And if this balance is disrupted with loss of estrogen, there becomes a bone loss. And with that, osteoporosis. And you can see this lady as she's aged has become more stooped and eventually ended in a wheelchair because her bones and her spine have become um, fractured actually. And it's caused her to be like this. And you can imagine in a wheelchair, She'll be in a lot of pain. She might have difficulty breathing, digesting. And certainly she's lost a lot of her independence as well. We know that around one in two women over the age of 50 will have osteoporosis. One in three will develop an osteoporotic hip fracture. And most women don't know they've got osteoporosis until they have a fracture. But having a hip fracture is actually quite dangerous. It has a higher mortality, so a higher death rate than most types of cancer. Around 25% of women will die in the first year after a hip fracture. And then there's all these other complications that occur. And for a lot of women and men who have hip, hip fractures, it's loss of their independence, which is really important. So osteoporosis is something that lots of people don't think about. It doesn't reach the front pages of the newspapers, but it should do because it is preventable for a lot of people. We also know that estrogen is very important to the way our heart works and the way our blood vessels function. So women are actually about five times more likely to have a heart attack when they go through the menopause. And actually women who have a heart attack actually have a worse prognosis than men. So trying to reduce risk of heart disease is really important after the menopause. Without estrogen, there's an increased risk of type two diabetes and also obesity as well. Women push on weight for lots of reasons after the menopause. And sometimes that's because the body's trying to make its own estrogen. And there is a very weak, not a very nice type of estrogen, in fact, in, in fat cells. And so people tend to put on weight, but also people often don't exercise as much. They don't always eat the right food. Sugar cravings can be very common with low estrogen levels. So therefore putting on weight is, is really common. Um, a lot of people find concentration, memory very difficult. So it's no surprise there's an increased risk of dementia um, after the menopause as well. Women are far more likely to develop dementia than men. And actual clinical depression can increase. Also, we know that COVID severity um, worsens without hormones. Oestrogen actually helps protect um, the immune function. So it helps our cells fight infection. So how do we make a diagnosis of the menopause? What should we do? Should we go to the doctors and just ask for a blood test? No, actually, there isn't a blood test. A hormone blood test that can be done that you might see advertised 
are actually not very useful, especially women over the age of 45. We wouldn't do them to diagnose the menopause because they can vary a lot. So the diagnosis is made on symptoms. And actually, so us as women should make the diagnosis ourselves and then it help inform our, our doctors. So there's a menopause symptom questionnaire, which is available to download on um, the menopause charity website. And, and women should really ideally do this every three or four months. And if their symptoms are changing, then it's suggestive that, and certainly if their periods are altering or their periods have stopped, then it's likely that many, if not all of their symptoms are due to their reduced hormones. So this is a really useful thing for everyone to do. It can also be available to do on the Balance app. Um, and with this, you can you can monitor your cycle as well, and then you can produce a, um, a health report to go to your doctor and say, these are my periods, these are my symptoms, I think I'm perimenopausal or menopausal, and I'm here to talk to you about my future health and my treatment that might be available. So menopause really should be an opportunity. It shouldn't be something that we just need to battle through because no one will give us any rewards for doing that. But if we really reflect and think, how are we going to get the best out of our future years when we're menopausal? Then it's, it's being the right healthcare professional early so we can really transform our lives and keep them as healthy as possible. And think about preventing disease. So how can we manage it? Talking is really important. As women, we like to talk, but it's really important to talk and realise you're not alone, actually, is, is really key. Learning the accurate facts, there's a huge amount of noise about menopause at the moment. You have to make sure the facts that you hear are evidence-based. It's really important, check the source. We all need to think about our lifestyle. We need to think about our diet. We need to think about exercise. That's in crucial, whatever we do. And it's even more important as we get older. And Rebecca's going to talk about HRT, that's three letter words, hormone replacement therapy. And there are alternatives for some people who choose not to take HRT or who might not want to take it in the first instance. But for the majority of women, they can safely take HRT. There's lots of information out there. This is a book I've written. I've already mentioned the Balance app, Menopause Doctor website. And on the Menopause Charity website, we've put some information that you can download and share. And there's a whole community of information from different experts as well. So what we really need to do when we discuss our, to our healthcare professional, we go in the UK on the, the 2015 NICE guidance and a lot of people internationally use them as well. And they clearly say that your doctor or healthcare professional should discuss the stages of the menopause, common symptoms, how to diagnose it, lifestyle changes, benefits and risks of treatment and how the menopause can affect your future health. In an ideal world, all this will be discussed, but I realise it's not an ideal world. So just want to give you some tips about really how to get the most of your consultation, especially if it's just a 10 minute consultation with your doctor. So being prepared is really important. If you do your homework before, you'll get more out of your appointment with your doctor. So I would print off a health report from the Balance app. Make a note of any periods that you have or haven't had or how they've changed. Your doctor doesn't need to know every single date, but just as a rough guide what your periods have been doing. It's also very useful to go with a list of medication. I know your doctor will have what's prescribed, but there might be other things you take, so supplements, vitamins, other things that you might have got in from other clinics. It's really important your doctor knows that. I also think it's worth having a friend or a family member with you. Now, a lot of people are doing remote consultations, but you can have someone sitting next to you. It's really useful to have an extra pair of ears, but also maybe an extra mouth as well. If you find that it's difficult to express how you're feeling, someone else might be able to butt in and, and just help as well. And that can be very useful for healthcare professionals. Obviously, I find it very nerve wracking going to see the doctor because I always think I'm wasting their time and they're always busy, but actually, you really want to get the most out of it. And the doctor and the healthcare professional, if it's a nurse you're seeing or a pharmacist or someone else, they want to help you. They really want to help and do the best. But it's trying to be persistent. If you feel that you're not getting what you want, then just carry on and be persistent. Um, if you're really not getting anywhere, 
then it might be worth saying, well, I think I'll see another doctor or nurse or another healthcare professional. And is there anyone that you can recommend in the practice? Um, you don't want to fall out. Having a confrontational diagnosis is not helpful for anyone. So if you want HRT, then I would say that at the start, I would go with my health report and say, I've read about HRT and I've decided it's going to be beneficial for me and I would like to try it. Because then the doctor knows exactly what you're coming for. And in a minute, out of 10 minute consultation, you've given them the diagnosis and you've explained what you want. If you've done some homework about the different types of HRT, then you could even start to talk about that as well. Sadly, we know around um, three quarters of women are offered or given antidepressants, which is not a treatment for the low mood associated with the perimenopause or menopause. We know that some women have clinical depression and obviously it can help, but we don't give them first line just for the low mood and anxiety symptoms. So if people are offered antidepressants, then I would suggest just challenge your healthcare professional and say, what are the reasons for you giving them to me? If you're giving them to me for my low mood, I know they won't work. I know I'm not clinically depressed, so could I consider not taking them or consider hormones or consider something else? Um, because it's very important. Sadly, a lot of healthcare professionals still haven't been given good quality information um, about the safety of HRT. They haven't been given education about the menopause in general. And obviously, as part of what the charity is doing, is we're really trying to support and help as many healthcare professionals as possible have access to good quality menopause education. On the Menopause Doctor website, there is this easy HRT prescribing guide that I've written, which is referenced as well. So people can download it themselves and take it to their doctors. And a lot of doctors use it um, and prescribing nurses, but it's a useful narrative to start. And if you find the doctor doesn't know much about HRT or the body identical HRT, then you could leave that with them and say, look, can I make another appointment to discuss this in detail? And then finally, there's this uh, uh, PDF that you can download that's um, on the menopause uh, charity website that we've written just about how to ask your GP for help. And that just goes through some information as well, which might help guide you and just give you a bit more confidence to get the right help and support. So I hope that's been useful just to set the scene really as to why the menopause is so important. So um, I hope that just will help a little bit and then I'll hand you over to Rebecca. I'm just going to stop my sharing and, and give her the control so she can take over. Thank you. Have I got control? This is the question. Thank you very much, Louise. So I'm just going to share. Just a second, there we are, lovely. So thank you very much for inviting me along today just to say who I am. I'm Rebecca Lewis, I'm a GP and menopause specialist and work at Newton Health as a clinical director alongside Louise. Um, and what I just want to start with, say I have no uh, financial disclosures. I am a director of Newton Health Menopause and Wellbeing Centre, a director of Newton Health Research and Education, a not-for-profit company, and also a director of Balance. So I thought my remit today really is to have a deeper dive into HRT. There's so much confusion about HRT, um, so many myths that I really hope we can dispel quite a lot today and make your minds clearer about it. So really that's my remit today is to talk about HRT. And I thought the best way to do that is to start with a case study that we see here all the time in our clinic. And we'll start with Laura, who's age 46, and she's a midwife in a busy hospital. And she was brilliant at her job. She loved her job. It was just meant for her. She'd been uh, you know, very experienced and worked many years there. But at the age of 46, she began to develop some symptoms. She suddenly couldn't sleep at night, having always been a very good sleeper. She used to wake frequently through the night and then it was difficult to get back off again. Her anxiety, which she hadn't really experienced before, she suddenly, used to she suddenly became much more anxious. 
And things like driving gave her a lot of anxiety. She had never had a problem with that without driving. She'd been driving since she was 18. But suddenly she felt she wasn't able to drive on the motorways. She wasn't able to drive at night time and just felt vulnerable and anxious about an accident or being trapped in a car, more of a claustrophobic feeling. Her mood became low and flat, not depressed particularly, which by which I mean a constantly low, um, flat mood, more really just flat and grey, a loss of joy in things. So things you used to love to do in interest her, she didn't get pleasure from it. When the children came home from school announcing what they had done, some lovely things, she, she put on her face and smiled, but inside she could not feel that excitement or that joy, an absence of joy, if you like. Um, her concentration and memory started to deteriorate. She had to make lists, she couldn't get the words out, she irritated her family because she couldn't get simple words, um, couldn't remember people's names. And as you can imagine, all these symptoms led to a loss of confidence in herself and her performance at work. Her migraines, which she'd always suffered from, became much worse as well. She had a lot of other things going on in her life and she thought that they were to start with, it was all due to her circumstances. She worked very hard in the NHS, long hours and, and shift work. Her mother had recently been diagnosed with dementia and often used to call her at night uh, very confused, which is distressing for Laura and, of course, for her mother. She felt overwhelmed as time went on. Even everyday tasks became impossible. Going into the kitchen, she didn't know what to do first, to do the ironing, to do the washing up, you know, all these tasks seemed to come at her and she didn't know how to prioritize um, and how to sort her day out. She felt overwhelmed by everyday things. Her anxiety worsened so much so that she found it very difficult to leave the house. That was the only place she felt relatively safe and calm. Her confidence got worse. Her migraines were now up to a frequency of twice a week. She also had vaginal dryness and cystitis type symptoms, yet every time she went to the GP, the urine was clear when they checked it, but yet she still had antibiotics. Her periods had become heavier and lasting now for eight days, and her cycle had changed from a 26 day cycle, uh, sometimes to a 28, whereas before she was always very regular having 28 day cycles. So it was a little change in the cycle, but the heaviness was there and the periods were lasting longer. And she felt that her symptoms were worse just before her period. They're bad enough anywhere, but they seemed to be worse. And she wondered whether it could be her menop menopause or hormones. So she went to the, um, see her healthcare professional and she was advised that her symptoms were nothing to do with the hormones as she was still having periods and she'd not had the classical symptoms of hot flushes or night sweats. So she was given the antidepressant and anti-anxiety tablet, citalopram and diazepam even because her panic attacks were so um, severe and she'd never suffered with this before. In fact, the medication didn't really help her and gave her side effects, so she did stop taking them. But her anxiety worsened and she had to be signed off sick. She felt she, there was no way she could get back to her job, which was demanding. To be in that role, you have to be on it. You have to be sharp um, and with it and well rested. And so she handed her resignation, which is really sad. And this was an enormous cost to her and her immediate family as she was the main earner. Six months later, she came to the clinic and she was started on HRT. A diagnosis of the perimenopause was made and she was given an Eastern patch and progesterone tablets. I reviewed her three months later and she felt very much better on the HRT um, already. We optimized her dose, we changed the dose, we tailored it to, to her needs and we also added in testosterone. Six months later, she really felt entirely back to her normal self and had managed to get a job again back in midwifery, which she loved. And she started to feel herself and started to thrive again. And the good news was 12 months later, she had actually applied for a promotion and been successful in becoming a senior ward manager. So a lovely story in the end, um, which was fortunate, but you can see how it could have gone different ways if intervention hadn't occurred. So what is the menopause? Well, Louise has explained very clearly what it is. And I think in simple terms, it's a hormone deficiency. We run out of vital hormones that the ovary produces, estrogen, progesterone and testosterone. So what's the solution? 
as in with every other hormone deficiency, for example, low thyroid, calcium deficiency, we replace the hormones. And that is all HRT is. It is simply replacing the lost female hormones or topping up the hormones back to the normal physiological level women have. So let's talk about HRT. So much controversy certainly was in the past and still continues to this day, unfortunately. And why is that? Because benefits of HRT, quite naturally, as you, as you would conclude, it's an estrogen deficiency, it's a hormone deficiency. So surely if we replace the hormones, then the symptoms will get better. And indeed they do. And for the majority of women, the benefits of, of HRT actually outweigh any risks. And that's a direct quote from NICE Guidance 2015. We also know that HRT reduces the risk of osteoporosis, which we heard about from Louise's talk, how common that is, but under recognized, it reduces our risk of diabetes, heart disease. In fact, HRT can halve our risk of heart disease, reduces our risk of dementia, osteoarthritis, depression, and even death a little bit. But yes, this sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Only 10% of women take HRT, which is shockingly low. Why are so many few, so few women taking HRT? It's because women are worried and healthcare professionals are worried. In fact, society is worried about it. And this was due to the 2000s, you probably remember yourself, of a report in the press that was uh, a study, a very, very large study in America was leaked to the press too early and headlines immediately. HRT causes breast cancer, increases your risk of stroke and clot. Well, how alarming is that? So as you can imagine, women, quite a few women were taking HRT in the 80s and 90s. They stopped it immediately. And people grew up with these headlines. So women now approaching the menopause, they're probably in their 20s when these headlines were around. And it's in their psyche still. HRT causes breast cancer. And this was based on this study, a very, very large, expensive study in America. And it was set up to see, look at the long-term risks of benefits of HRT, but there were some flaws already in the study. The average age of women was 63, much older than we would usually start on HRT. And many of the women, in fact, 70%, were obese or overweight and had already had a history of heart disease. And they were also given high dose HRT for their age. And a, old fashioned type of HRT, a tablet type of HRT with old fashioned types of progesterones. And the data was leaked early to the press. Subsequently, the data was reanalyzed properly with a, uh, many other doctors looking at it clearly. And in fact, the opposite has found, but these facts did not make it to the press like they should have done. And I can say now that women who only have estrogen only HRT, these are women who've had a hysterectomy, they only need estrogen replacement. They have been followed up by this same study. And it has been shown that when the correct statistics are applied and looked up properly, they have had a slightly reduced risk of, of breast cancer after 18 years of taking estrogen. We also have found out that young women must have hormones. If they don't, they have a much increased risk of cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis. And in fact, a recent study has shown an increased risk of mortality, death rate slightly, and increased risk of all types of diseases, including asthma, addictive problems, etc. So that young women have no increased risk of breast cancer, or no increased risk. It is really important that young women in their 30s and 40s have their hormones replaced at least until the age of 51, because they can only get benefit uh, for their future health. So the breast cancer that, that alarms women, you can understand why, because we probably know we may have suffered ourselves or no friends and family who've, who've suffered with this cancer. It's a common cancer. Uh, unfortunately, one in seven of us will suffer with, will be diagnosed with breast cancer. However, we are seven times as likely to die of heart disease and stroke and dementia. We have to think about other illnesses as well um, as the breast cancer. So breast cancer is more common as we get older. Um, if we have a strong family history, that increases our risk. Well, I'm afraid we, we can't do anything about getting old and, or our genetics. 
However, there's some lifestyle risks um, that we can do something about. Obesity, being overweight or obese increases our risk of breast cancer. Drinking too much alcohol does and being uh, sedentary or reduced exercise also increases our risk of breast cancer. So those lifestyle risks increase our breast cancer. What about HRT? Does it, the key question, does it increase our risk of breast cancer? Well, I've already said that estrogen only HRT does not. And in fact, one study, the normal study of the WHI showed it decreased it a little bit. But combined HRT, which is estrogen and progesterone for women with a womb, they need both. It may, in some cases, increase it a little more, um, but it is a very low increased risk. It is less, in fact, than the increased risk of breast cancer of drinking two units of alcohol every night, which is two small glasses of wine or one large glass of wine every night. So that risk of drinking two units of alcohol is a little higher. That increased risk of alcohol consumption at that level is a little higher than the in slight increased risk of breast cancer with combined HRT. So we need to take that into account when we make our decision about treatments. And we have to realize that there, in some cases, there may be a very small increased risk, but it is incredibly small. And we have to weigh that slight increased risk against the enormous benefits, as we saw and heard in the case study with Laura, how it transformed her life. So antidepressants and the menopause, and Louise touched on this as well. This is a common problem. We see a lot of women who have this flat, low mood, increasing anxiety and poor sleep. And understandably, people can think um, it's depression. And the woman might well think it's depression because they've never been depressed before. This must be how it feels. And they're wrongly given antidepressants, uh, which actually do not help the mood. Um, and we know that actually that is not correct. We, the, the, the low mood of the menopause is most effectively treated with oestrogen. However, as Louise said, 70% had been offered antidepressants instead of HRT. But what type of HRT should we be using? Again, that's another confusing area. People have heard of tablets, of gels, of patches. But the gold standard, the best type of HRT, which we always advocate here, is body identical, it's called, or otherwise known as regulated bioidentical hormones. Now, what this means is a bit of a mouthful. It just means what it says. It is exactly the same chemical structure as our own hormones that, it, that the ovary produces. So the structure of the estrogen in the um, medication is exactly the same. So I love that from a physiological point of view because it's perfect. It's replacing the lost hormone with an identical hormone. So that really helps um, effectivity, more effective. Um, it is, it's, it's easier to use. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just much more physiological, has less side effects. And we give estrogen through the skin. Because if we give estrogen through the skin, we avoid going through it being metabolized by the liver as oral estrogens are. Um, and if it goes through the skin and not and is not metabolized by the liver, then there is no increased risk of blood clots. So it is safe for women who've had previous blood clots or who have diabetes or are overweight or at risk of blood clots. Um, so we give the estrogen through the skin and that can be as a patch or a gel or a spray. And we give the progesterone again as body identical progesterone called micronized progesterone, or also the marina coil is very useful for women needing contraception as well. And the reason we give progesterone is to protect the lining of the womb because estrogen can cause thickening of the blind lining of the womb, which could be unhealthy if went up, if it was allowed to continue giving estrogen on its own for some time. And um, so to prevent the thickening of the lining of the womb, we give a progesterone. And as I said, it can be as a body identical, micronized progesterone or in the form of the marina coil. We also look at testosterone um, because that is a really important female hormone. Again, people think testosterone is just for men, not at all. It is really important for many women. And I'll come on to that later. They're all derived from the yam plant. Um, and so it's a nice derivation source. In the old days, it was derived from pregnant mares, 
urine, not, not very nice, but this is a lovely natural source um, for all these hormones are derived from. You may have heard of all these definitions, are you on sequential, continuous, or estrogen only type of HRT? Well, really the choice is based on a few questions in, on average. If you have a womb lining, as we've said, estrogen on its own could cause thickening. So if you do have a womb lining, then we must add in progesterone. That's the only reason we really add in progesterone to protect the womb lining. If you don't have a womb, um, you've had a hysterectomy, then generally you only need estrogen only HRT, which is good because we know that estrogen only HRT actually doesn't have an impact on breast cancer risk. When was your last period? If it was over 12 months ago, then continuous combined HRT is needed. And that means taking the progesterone every day so that going forward in the end, you, you, you should not have any bleeding. If you're ha still having periods, you are given a regime where you have progesterone for half of the month. And at the end of the progesterone course, you have a bleed, a, break a break breakthrough bleed, if you like, uh, withdrawal bleed, much the same as the pill does. So estrogen through the skin, called transdermal estrogen, can come as patches. I've got some here actually, but uh, it's a bit difficult on the zoom sh to show you. Probably can't see. This is this is the the, the gel um, called Easter gel, um, and there's also Sandrina gel as well. And you pump it out and you put it on your hand and you rub it in every day on the arms or the inner thighs. That's how you would apply the gel. The patches are also the same, are impregnated with exactly the same estrogen. It's called 17 beta estradiol. That's the body identical estrogen. Um, and it's released every hour into the bloodstream. And the patches can stay on and just be changed twice a week. Um, so that's also another nice way to give the estrogen. It's really personal preference quite often. And there's also a spray out as well, which some women like to use. The good news about uh, transdermal estrogen is that you have VTE means uh, venous, thrombo, venous thromboembolic risk, which means DVT. There is no risk of blood clot, which is really important. And the other thing that's really important about estrogen through the skin is it doesn't affect this protein called sex hormone binding globulin, which is a protein that goes is raised when we have um, oral estrogen and, and a high level of sex hormone binding globulin can um, decrease our libido, which is often flagging anyway due to the menopause. So it avoids that and doesn't worsen libido if the estrogen is taken through the skin. So I would advocate transdermal estrogen should be given really for everybody because it is the best, the gold standard, but certainly for people who are obese, who have a history of migraine, um, who have diabetes, gallbladder or liver problems. That should be first line, as we said. Just equivalent doses you may find useful to know. Two pumps of estrogel is generally equivalent. It's not an absolute to 50 microgram patch, which could be changed, which is similar to one milligram oral estrogen, or this is one milligram Sandrina gel, or one to two sprays of Lenzetto. The purpose of this slide really is to show that people can change from a gel to a patch and back to a gel, you know, whatever, you know, quite easily, nothing set in stone. The progesterone component, again, is from the yam um, plant and body identical. And as we said, it is completely the same structure um, as our own progesterone. And this is really good because um, we have much less side effects. A lot of people can find progesterone a nasty, not, not so great to take if it's the old fashioned type of progesterone. Um, but this type of progesterone really diminishes side effects and has great beneficial effects on our sleep. Um, and anxiety levels. So very useful medication to have. This type of natural progesterone also has beneficial effects and it can improve our cardiovascular risk and help our lipids, lipid profile. Um, and it doesn't put our blood pressure up. In fact, it often reduces the blood pressure. There's no blood clot risk again, so that's fine to take for people who've had a previous clot. Um, and the really important thing as well about this type of progesterone is they've done a very large study in France for five years showing that there was no increased risk of breast cancer using this type of progesterone. So we come on now to testosterone and it's really important that we get the message over it's not at the male hormone that actually we've been running around with testosterone 
all our lives in our 30s and 40s many women find it very beneficial and it helps many symptoms the ovary in fact produces three times the amount of testosterone as estrogen and as the ovary fails and with time testosterone levels begin to to diminish testosterone replacement we've used for decades with good results however it is still off license that's not that unusual in medicine, actually. Uh, 10 to 15% of medications that we prescribe are off license, for example, many children's medications. Um, it is recommended as well by NICE guidance in 2015 for women with low libido, who st the libido is still low despite a good dose of HRT for three months because it can really help libido. So testosterone has many uses, not only libido, and I do think it can help some women's libido very well, others not so much because a million things affect libido. Number one, how you're feeling about yourself, how you're interacting with your partner, um, how tired you are, if you're getting vaginal dryness or soreness. So it's a, a many symptoms, many reasons why libido could be affected, but testosterone can help that. It also, and I find this really even more important, it really helps mood. It does help anxiety and sleep as well as concentration, memory and fatigue. So really the mind with this awful brain fog, not getting the right words, not being able to sequence your thoughts, it can really crisp up um, that the, the thought mechanisms, which is really important for women, and especially if they're working, even if they're not. We've got now really good trial data, randomized controlled trial, which is the gold standard of um, trials for four years to show how safe it is on the breast and the and the heart, although we've been using it for many decades, actually, with no adverse effects anecdotally. So testosterone prescribing should be considered in women with reduced libido despite HRT. And that's a direct quote from NICE guidance 2015. Mood, energy and concentration often improve as we have discussed. These are the sort of types of uh, testosterone we, we recommend. It's all the same hormone and testin and Testagel, you can see on the slide here, are available on the NHS. Um, Androfem, the pink one in the middle, is only available privately. Um, but it can be prescribed on the NHS, the Testin and the Testagel, but often we have to see a menopause specialist to do that. But it's often very helpful for younger women or women who've had the ovaries completely removed because the main source of production is the ovary. So if that has been removed, testosterone levels really do decline and cause this awful brain fog, lack of motivation and concentration. So it can be very helpful to replace. It can improve men, mood, energy and stamina as well. But it's not licensed for women, which is really wrong. And, and we're trying to change that. The last thing I want to talk about is genitourinary syndrome of the menopause, which sounds a bit of a mouthful. Um, it was otherwise referred to as vaginal atrophy or vaginal dryness. And this is a problem when we lose estrogen, the vagina and bladder are really affected due to, la uh, due to lack of estrogen. Um, and without estrogen, we get often vaginal dryness, pain, burning, irritation, itching, um, some people don't even have dryness, they may have increased secretions, um, but this is a, it can be a terrible, terrible symptom for some people. Some women are even unable to sit down because the burning pain is like sitting on a bonfire or wear underwear or tight jeans, for example. So it, it, you don't have to be sexually active to know that you're suffering with these symptoms. Also, the bladder is really under estrogen control, the bladder muscles there, the strength of the bladder. And without estrogen from the menopause, we get increased urinary frequency and urgency. Oh my God, I've got to go to the loo. You know, when you come back from shopping, you've got the keys in the door, the shopping hand, shopping at, at your feet. And suddenly, as soon as you get to the door, oh my God, I've got to go now quickly, quick, quick, quick. That's the urgency. And often urge incontinence, sometimes you don't make it in time, or stress incontinence, a cough and a sneeze, or going on the trampoline and you can leak. Because the muscles are weaker um, and unable to hold the urine so well. So really, you know, quite considerable symptoms. And the problem is, and the message we must get out there, actually, if you're suffering from these symptoms, without estrogen replacement or 
managing these with estrogen, they will get worse. It progresses over time. So unfortunately, we see a lot of elderly women in their 80s having recurrent urinary tract infections, soreness, burning still, um, which can cause agitation and confusion if they're suffering from dementia, it can make dementia worse because they're agitated because it's painful and, 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 and causing a lot of pain and they can't communicate properly because of their dementia. So it really takes its toll on women's health long term. So if we get in there early with oestrogen, we can prevent it. And it's very safe to take oestrogen locally in a form of pessary to help um, the blood flow and restore the architecture back to normal. And also it can be taken long term and alongside systemic HRT. Systemic means the HRT that goes into the blood, the gels you rub on and the tablets you take. It's very common, this uh, GSM problem, genital urinary syndrome of the menopause. 80% of postmenopausal women will experience this. But it's a huge taboo. Even talking about the menopause is a taboo, let alone coming in talking about vaginal dryness, discomfort with sex, um, some leaking, um, thrush, recurrent thrush. All these symptoms can arise due to a lack of oestrogen. And women are needlessly suffering, and it is so easy and so safe to treat. Yeah, at least a third of women do not seek medical advice. That's shocking, isn't it? Around 50% of women have had symptoms for more than three years before seeking help. And what happens is that without oestrogen, the pH changes and rises, becomes more alkaline, and this disrupts all the bacteria. We should have bacteria in the vagina. It's healthy, like we have bacteria in the gut. It's called the vaginal microbiome. We have a balance, a very finely regulated balance of bacteria and, and, and uh, fungal um, thrush and, and things it, within candida, within the vagina. And that's regulated by oestrogen. So when we lose oestrogen, the pH becoming drops and we get an overgrowth of um, thrush um, and BV, so women can have itching and soreness, recurrent thrush, and it's due to the underlying oestrogen deficiency. The, the lining of the, of the vagina becomes thinner, um, so local oestrogen will thicken that lining up, will increase blood flow, will improve vaginal lubrication, um, and maintain a good vaginal microbiome. It will maintain the balance of the bacteria within the vagina. Um, and it can take a little while to provide relief. So you have to keep going and you have to use the right dose. Often Vagifem is used um, and that's a good local oestrogen to use as a pessary. A woman simply inserts that um, every night for two weeks and then reduces the dose. Um, the guidelines say down to twice a week in the BNF, but actually that's often not enough and many people need it four times a week or alternate nights, which is perfectly safe to do so. They look like this, the pessary. Um, it's a little uh, applicator with a little tablet of oestrogen in, and it can simply be popped into the vagina in the evening. And it can really restore function and anatomy. So there's a Vagifem pessary as a local oestrogen, Overston cream you may have heard of as well. Um, it's estriol rather than estradiol, a slightly different estrogen, but still very effective and often very good for vulval or external soreness and irritation to use outside. Um, and estrin is a relatively newer um, estrogen, local estrogen, which is a ring you can see here on the slide, and that's impregnated with estradiol. And the ring is, is very small, it's quite easy to insert um, into the vagina. Uh, the woman can insert it herself, and it stays there for three months, and it emits um, estrogen every day. So it just really helps the vaginal um, tissues restore, increase the blood flow, etc. cetera. Um, the Vagifem as well could be used, or Overstim cream. There are many different types of local estrogen treatments. You can use them as long as, as needed. Hardly anything of the local estrogen goes into the systemic circulation. So it's very safe to use long-term um, and alongside systemic HRT for the majority of women. And you can have it on a repeat prescription. Also, lubricants and moisturizers can be really helpful and using the right type is important. If you're just using oestrogen locally on its own, there's no need to give progesterone to protect the lining of the womb because it's so tiny, the amount of oestrogen that actually gets into the systemic circulation, it won't 
um, cause any problems to the lining of the womb at all. As I said, some local um, lubricants and moisturizers are really helpful. Um, and I would recommend these type rather than others you might see in boots because this pH is correct for our, the vaginal um, uh, environment and the osmolality, the strength of, of, of of the lubricants is also correct for the vagina so it doesn't irritate many unfortunately perfume products we see in boots or any other chemists and you can see can irritate because uh, um, they're just not just devised properly really to go into the vagina and this can lubricate um, the the tissues and make a woman feel much more comfortable it won't change the anatomy so it won't restore the anatomy back but you can happily use this uh, as a soothing agent alongside local estrogen or on its own if your symptoms are minimal. So how long can menopausal symptoms last? How long do we have to take HRT? There's a common misconception we're going to get through the menopause. Well, symptoms really, some studies have shown that they last eight years, but I think these studies really are flawed because we know of many, many women who are still having hot flushes and sweats in their 90s. And also some, some symptoms will abate after time, but also women adapt to their symptoms and, and become, uh, think that their, their symptoms have gone because perhaps they've given up their job or they don't do exercise anymore because their muscles are, are achy and sore, or they always have an afternoon nap because they're so tired and this becomes the new normal. So they often think, I don't have any symptoms, but in fact, if you drill down, those symptoms are still there. The other thing is, so symptoms may settle earlier for some people, but in many, they could go on for decades. So that's number one with the symptoms of the menopause. And number two is you're never going to get estrogen back. The ovary has failed. Um, you know, simple, simple fact. We can't, it won't suddenly recover and we produce estrogen. And as we know, we now know we've only really found out about that really in the last uh, 10, 20 years, probably about the, the health risks of living without estrogen or living with low estrogen, as Louise explained earlier, on the bones, causing osteoporosis, on the heart, um, increased risk of dementia, type 2 diabetes. So it has a lot of benefits for our long term health. So I think the decision how long to take HRT is really often down to the woman, how she's feeling on it, and there's no time limit. We have to get away from this idea it's for five years and the lowest dose. That's that's a nonsense now. It actually, you can take it for long term if it's giving you benefit, and it will always benefit your bones when you're on it. It will always improve bone density. If you stop HRT, bone density will begin to decline as well. So it's an informed decision. We always say you should see your healthcare professional every year uh, to talk through the, 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 the pros and the cons. And that will be an individualized consultation depending on you and your own symptoms and your own health risks and what else is going on in your, in your medical life. So if, as I said, when, when do you stop HRT? Well, you don't necessarily have to if you choose not to, um, but have an annual uh, review with your healthcare professional. So there's no maximum length of time. Um, many women, also another myth we need to um, deconstruct is that many women think, well, after five years, I'll, the symptoms will have stopped. Well, we've just said that doesn't always happen. And also people think if I start HRT now, when I stop it, I've got to, I've got to go back to square one, like snakes and ladders, back, back down the snake and start all over again. That is not the case. Um, it doesn't defer the evil or put off the evil day of going through it all. If you stop your HRT after five years um, and your symptoms um, continue, I'm afraid they would have continued anyway. It's not because HRT has put put that off that time or if you if you're a luckier person and your symptoms have settled if you stop it they won't be there um, but then you'll still have to live with your estrogen deficiency long term on your um, future health risk so that's a decision for you really to make often older women need lower doses actually because their requirements go down as certainly over the age of 60 in general um, so we often change and that's the point of having an annual review to see what dose you're right is it appropriate still now time has marched on um, and again 
Really, there's not much evidence about whether HRT could be stopped suddenly or, or, or gradually reduced. I think there's a little bit more now coming that actually it's probably nicer to do it in a, in a gradual, I certainly would think that, in a gradual way to slow it down um, over months, really. So it's not a shock for the system. But if you had to stop it or something or you lost, it, lost, lost the tablets or something, it's not going to cause enormous harm just suddenly stopping it in, in one way. So really that brings me to the end of the talk and I hope that was helpful to find out about um, HRT and we're going to open up to questions now. So I'm going to pass over, I think, to uh, Radhika. Um, how do I stop, stop share? That's right. Thank you, Rebecca, that was brilliant. I passed over, yes, sorry, there we are. Got it, I was looking. Great, we've got some great comments in the Q&A of how informative and um, knowledgeable all that is to cover perimenopause and menopause so well between you and the benefits of HRT and how clearly it can be used. I'm gonna start putting some of the questions together and um, we've been looking at so many of them and some of them have been answered as we go along by everyone working at, with us as well, with, with Lucy, Dr. Sarah Ball and Shona there as well. So the, one of the questions that themes that commonly comes throughout everything in the questions, and I'd like to direct this question at um, Louise if I can, is if you're in your perimenopause or say if you're 48, how would you know the difference between perimenopause or PMT if you're still having regular periods? Yeah, that's a great question, isn't it? So PMT or PMS, sometimes it's called, is really people notice they get very sensitive to changing hormones. And so classically, it's where people get symptoms, sometimes just a day or two before their period, sometimes it's a week before. And that's when our estrogen levels tend to drop. So we find that a lot of women who have had PMS find it gets a lot worse. So it can either be more severe or it can last longer. And then if periods start to change in frequency or nature, they're often perimenopausal. But one of the treatments for PMS is actually estrogen. You just top it up. So um, a lot of women who we see have come with perimenopausal symptoms, but they have a history of PMS. And actually, they probably would have benefited earlier with a bit of estrogen. And what's really important is it doesn't actually matter what the diagnosis is, if it's related to hormones. And sometimes we don't know whether someone is perimenopausal or menopausal, or we don't know that their symptoms are related. So we might see a woman who, um, like me, for example, was perimenopausal, but I might have had a lymphoma. And how do we know that just on a story? Of course we don't know, but we look at the overall picture, we see if there is anything else worrying. And what we often do is then say to a woman, I don't know how many of your symptoms are related to your hormones, but what I do know is, as Rebecca so eloquently said, the benefits of HRT outweigh any risk. So I'll give you HRT anyway, and let's review and monitor to see how you are. If, for example, I had taken HRT and three months later I was getting worsening night sweats despite taking a good dose of HRT, that is where my doctor would intervene and try and find out if I did have a cancer or something else. Um, and it's the same with sort of PMS, perimenopause. We often don't know because there isn't a magic blood test to do, but we will know as a clinical response. And because HRT is so safe, because it's so easily reversible as well. So if someone decides to stop, it's out of their body the next day. So it's very low risk medicine. And I think this is what we're sort of trying to come across really here to say that sometimes we just try it and see, and then the answer is in the, the proof is in the pudding, if you like. That's really interesting, isn't it? Because as a GP, I find in my colleagues as well, we really get hung up on, is it this or is it true menopause? And I think it's really interesting what you're saying. And one of the charity's initiatives is to get more education out there and just how important it is to think, let me manage the menopause and let's see how other things develop as we go along. So that's really fascinating. Uh, thank you so much, because I think all the, our professional colleagues could really do with that reassurance as well. Great. So Rebecca, if I can come to yourself, just sort of building on that same question. If a woman is perimenopausal and her symptoms are quite mild, but yet noticeable, should she still be taking or thinking about taking HRT and going for that? 
Well, again, it's an individualized choice and an informed choice. That's all I ever would want for a woman, for her choice to be informed. But I would say there are plenty of good reasons why you would like to start early. And number one, the scientific reason. We know that the earlier we replace hormone uh, deficiency with HRT within 10 years of your last period, we can actually really benefit from the long-term health effects. So uh, we know that we can halve risks of heart disease if HRT started within 10 years. But also the earlier um, would be better because this is in time for the um, you know, protected effects of estrogen not to be lost. Because if we start it after, it can still benefit at any age, by the way. But it's even more of a benefit if we start it before we've really lost those protective effects of estrogen on our vessels and on the body all around. Also, I want to prevent tragedies. We heard about Laura, and I think just coming back to her, not everyone's going to be as severely affected as Laura. It's not always that severe, although sometimes it's more severe. So I would like to manage it. I would like to think about my future health. Um, before suddenly, you know, I was struggling at work and I was in a difficult time. Perhaps relationships had, had, uh, had gotten worse. So I think the earlier, the better, really. But it's up to the individual, of course. That's great. I mean, we see this a lot in women, don't we, in, in, in work, because they tend to wait till they're right down on their knees before they seek yeah. help. And then if they have a struggle to get that help, it knocks their confidence and their health even more so. Yeah. So it's interesting. We almost need to start being a lot more proactive with it. That's great. Now, so if a woman is going to the, we've got several questions that sort of follow the similar theme and this common thread of I'm going to see my GP and I, you know, my periods have stopped or I'm, my periods are erratic and I'm being told, no, it can't be the menopause because your periods were still within the last year. Should they, what, what strategy or what, what themes should they use? I know Louise has mentioned some things of which can help in terms of the balance app and some of the information and there's a professional's leaflet we have. Anything else, should they just keep going back and what else can they do? Is that, is that for me? Is that, that... Sorry, that's for Louise. You can answer if you want. <laughs> I think I think it's all about being empowered actually and being knowledgeable. And there's lots of confusion out there. And one of the confusing points is that HRT is actually not licensed for women who are perimenopausal. If you look it up in our big book, the British National Formula, or if you look it up online, it's usually licensed when a woman is postmenopausal, so a year after her last period. And so therefore. A lot of doctors who don't have the confidence in HRT will think, well, they can't give it actually. So, so this is where education for healthcare professionals is really important because a lot of doctors have grown up in the last 20 years learning from learned people actually that HRT is dangerous and it's a last resort treatment. And that's because it's based on this wrong information that Rebecca was talking about. So what we actually want to do as a charity, obviously, is to help educate the healthcare professionals because if we can, as women, get the information and we can allow healthcare professionals to get the right education, we can join the dots. And that's what's really important, actually. So a lot of doctors will say, no, you can't because your perimenopause will have HRT because they're acting on the knowledge that they've, they've learned that they thought HRT was really dangerous or not licensed. But when we talk about license, that's not the same as regulated. So there's a lot of drugs that we prescribe as doctors off license. So for example, if someone has nerve pain, we often give um, a drug called amitriptyline, which is actually an antidepressant, but in lower doses, it can switch off the nerves. Now it's not licensed for that use, some things we give to children um, for reflux, for example, something um, like a meprazole is not licensed for children, but we know it works. And to get the licensing indications can take a long time and it doesn't always, it's not a priority for, for the people that regulate medications, but it is a regulated product. So all the HRT that is recommended are regulated. So therefore, if I prescribe it or Rebecca prescribes it or Matika prescribes it, wherever location we're at, we know what it is. It's made with the same really good quality standards. But something like testosterone isn't licensed for women, but we use a regulated product. 
So some people will have heard of these compounded bioidentical hormones, which are not regulated or licensed, and they are very different, never to be used actually and not recommended. Um, so when a doctor says, no, you can't, this is where it's really important to actually explore and say why. And if they say, oh, because it's not licensed or because it's too dangerous, you can say, well, actually, there's more evidence now. The body identical hormones are safer. I can leave you some information. Could I come back next week and have another discussion with you? And there's few people asking the questions, you know, I'm too, I've been told I'm too young. Now, we've already heard no one's too young. Our youngest patient's actually 14 who never had a period. She was menopausal before her period started, but she never had any. So no one is too young. Uh, but actually, when I was at medical school, I was told if someone is young and doesn't have their periods, make sure they're not pregnant and then don't worry about it. So, you know, 10, 20 years ago, I would have said to someone, no, you can't be menopausal, because I didn't realise it was so common. So we have to try and marry up this education. But I think as menopausal and perimenopausal women, we need to be able to help guide healthcare professionals because they are so busy and they have so much to learn. But actually, those people like us who do a lot of menopause work, it is very rewarding medicine because once you give women the right dose and type of HRT, not only do you improve their symptoms, but we're also improving future health, which is so important. Brilliant. No, you make the point so well. It's so, so important. So if a woman has started HRT, Rebecca, if I can come to you, some, some of the things that we see commonly is it's, it's given to them without such a clear instruction as you've given in terms of how they're taking it, but also how to what to expect. Mm. And one of the things we often see women, and there's a few questions about this, is that they get breast tenderness or they may get bleeding problems. Do you have some advice in what they can do in terms of addressing those or what sort of time frame they should be looking at for a review? Yeah, I mean, the, these symptoms you're talking about, Radhika, the um, breast tenderness and um, irregular bleeding are very common. They're side effects. Um, irregular bleeding of my ladies it's a good sign it's a sign that the estrogen is going into the system and it's beginning to work um, often when you first start hrt we can have some irregular bleeding and it can take a few months to settle down many women may have experienced with other hormones they've taken in the past such as the pill breakthrough bleeding for example and yes the bleeding can be a nuisance but often it settles but it does take three months quite often to settle. And after a change in your dose, you can experience some irregular bleeding. And again, that can go on for, two, for a few months and then it should settle. Um, breast tenderness is common. Progesterone can cause breast tenderness and estrogen can cause breast tenderness. And pop, a lot of women think um, it's always due to too much estrogen. And that's not the case. It's usually due to a fluctuating estrogen. So actually from going from a normal level down to a low level can cause breast tenderness, um, as well as going from a low level to a high level. It's this fluctuation is often causes a lot of breast tenderness. It doesn't mean the level is too high, um, but yes, that is a quite a common um, symptom or side effect. And generally, I say to women, I ex explain to start with, so their expectations are set. So, you know, often it doesn't happen. But if it does, they think, oh, I know why. It's got nothing to do with breast cancer. I think people worry about, oh, my breasts are tender. It's completely different. It's a completely different way. It's just um, the, 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 the ducts are being a little bit stimulated by estrogen, which is a natural and what would happen. Um, you know, the same way we get breast tender and it's often just before our period when our estrogen levels drop, in fact. So it doesn't mean to say they're toxic or they're having far too much, I think a lot of people think. So if we talk about it, first of all, then and explain that, then that um, helps anxiety. Um, and little few tips I use, I say, well, if it happens, try and push on because it usually settles with time. But it can take some women who are much more sensitive in that area um, can take several weeks actually to settle down um, month, you know, a couple of months sometimes and, and good tips would be to wear a sports bra to stop any movement that really does help help women because even just touching or you know accidentally brushing you know the wall or something in the corridor that can be very tender uh, and painful so using a sports bra and at night and evening primrose oil um, you can get from the health food shop or star flower oil often quite helpful too but usually just push on and it will settle Brilliant, thank you so much. That's so reassuring, such a common question that we get asked. And that's sadly a common reason for stopping HRT as well. 
and that's something that really needs me clearing up. Probably, I probably should say if you are if you haven't had a period and you start bleeding on the HRT, yes, we we do expect that to happen for the first three to six months or following a change of dose. But if it goes on longer than that and you've established on HRT and you don't have periods, they stop long ago anyway, and you're on HRT and then out of the blue, you know, a year later, you suddenly have a bleed that should be reported um, to your healthcare professional. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. So reassuring. That's great. And very clear as well. So you know exactly how to follow things. So with this, with the movement that we've got going at the moment and the interest that has started in menopause, Louise, if I can come to you, if we've got more women considering going and seeking help, more professionals getting the right information and the right knowledge to feel confident to prescribe, with women who are starting HRT, what sort of checks should they expect in terms of the things that have really come through on questions is the things you mentioned blood tests aren't necessary, but other things such as blood pressure, should that be checked? Should they be considering a DEXA scan? What are your suggestions on that? Yeah, so it's a really good question because um, in the past, a lot more investigations were done. So when I qualified in the 90s, we used to do we used to do blood pressure routinely. Um, actually, more people used to do some hormone blood tests as well. But now the guidelines are very clear. The evidence is very clear that actually women don't need to have any investigations. So um, if we look at the guidelines, if a woman's over 45, she certainly doesn't need a hormone blood test to diagnose. Blood pressure is useful as a well woman check, but actually it doesn't stop HRT being prescribed. And the guidelines are very clear if someone has blood pressure, high blood pressure or raised blood pressure, that should be addressed and managed appropriately. But women can still have HRT. And if women have estrogen through the skin as a patch gel or spray with the natural micronized progesterone, both of those have been shown to actually lower blood pressure because they dilate the blood vessels a little bit, they're anti-inflammatory on the lining of the blood vessels. So actually they can be beneficial. So there's no need to delay having HRT if women have raised blood pressure. Now, when women are between 40 and 45, the guidelines say that blood tests may be helpful. In practice, I find they're actually not because they vary so much. If a woman's under 40, now the guidelines say to make a diagnosis, women should have at least two blood tests of this FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, at least six weeks apart. Now, I've seen lots of women in my clinic who have had FSH blood tests who have that be normal, but they're sitting there telling me the periods have changed or sometimes the periods have stopped. They're getting night sweats, brain fog, fatigue, muscle joint pains, and some of them are getting urinary tract infections. So these are all symptoms of the menopause. And so I actually then say to these women, like I've said before, I don't know whether you're menopausal or perimenopausal, but let's give you some hormones and see because the dose is so low and it's so safe. And then often after three months, people will might not feel completely better, but they might start to say, gosh, actually, I'm having less night sweats or or, or, or um, I'm having less um, joint pain or whatever. So that's answering the question. Now we do sometimes do blood tests, especially in young women, to make sure there aren't other reasons for their symptoms. Or if they have had POI, premature ovarian insufficiency, without a known trigger, we might do other blood tests, such as a thyroid test, a blood sugar level, test for celiac. Doing the bone density scan, the guidelines say if a woman's over 40, she should do because osteoporosis increases so much with younger women without hormones. But actually, I feel that every woman should have a dex scan. I think every man should as well, actually. One in five men will develop osteoporosis, one in two women. And like I've already said, most of us won't know what our bone density is until we fall and fracture, which we don't want to do. So sadly, in the NHS in the UK, very hard to get a DEXA scan unless you've got really high risk. So if you have early menopause, you could have a DEXA scan. But even women who are in their 40s and 50s, it's probably quite a good idea to have a baseline DEXA scan. But none of these tests need doing before taking HRT. Even doing um, routine breast screening, it's important if women choose to, to do regular screening in line with whichever country they're in the program. But you don't have to have more screening because you're on HRT. And that's really important. Some women think, oh, I just get my breast checked more frequently. But you don't need to, because as we've heard, the risk of breast cancer actually doesn't increase with most types of HRT. And even if there is an increase, it's so small. 
So self-examination, obviously, we should all be doing it anyway. Um, so it's actually very easy to start taking or start giving HRT as a doctor in the first consultation or even the second if you're having a follow-up consultation. You don't need to wait for fancy blood tests to be done. And that's really the case of a lot of delay. It takes a lot of women a lot of courage to get to that stage of getting help and that delay can lead to that. Now, thank you so much. So Rebecca, coming to yourself again, we've got several questions on the theme of doses and yeah. what's appropriate with HRT. And it causes a bit of confusion in women and health professional, I can say as a GP with GP colleagues, yeah. uh, what dose to use and when, um, what dose to drop down or increase by. And one of the common things that GPs will, who are less confident in prescribing will try and use the least possible dose. So yes, it's another good question, isn't it? And, and uh, I certainly say it's, it's individualised. We're all very different. Our menopause is as unique as we are and our dosage will be as unique as we are almost. Um, as, as I've said, the transdermal estrogen is the best type of HRT, the regulated body identical um, HRT. And estrogen taken through the skin is brilliant because of no increased risk of blood clot and what we've already said, um, and it's more effective and safer and the dose can be titrated. Um, we know that there's often a tenfold difference in absorption through the skin in some people. So for no obvious reason, some skin, skin absorbs estrogen well, other, um, sometimes skin doesn't absorb uh, so well. Um, so if you put a 50 microgram patch on one lady, she might attain quite good levels and that will be enough. We have to get these levels up to a certain extent to control the symptoms and to protect the heart and the bones for our future health. We have to have enough going around to, to do the job so a 50 microgram patch might be be fine for one for one woman um, but it, if she's absorbing say 100 percent of it if, if another woman doesn't absorb so well so perhaps she only absorbs 50 percent to attain the same level she's going to need double that dose to get to the same level so it will vary from person to person um, and really its guideline is 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 really the the the, the low it's the it's the dose that will adequately control your symptoms. It's a clinical diagnosis in the main. So if those symptoms become under good control, you know that your dose is good. And we do back this up sometimes. That's when we do take blood levels. Um, they are fluctuating a little bit, but it gives us an idea of how much estrogen is in the in the blood system. So sometimes that can help guide the dosage. But as I said, the main reason is your clinical response and your clinical symptoms. So looking at the story. So people's doses will change. And often uh, young women um, need much higher doses. They have greater metabolic demands on the estrogen. They metabolize it quickly. Or women who do a lot of exercise often, um, you know, their body eats away the eats away the estrogen, if you like, and, and gets rid of it quite quickly. So they may need higher doses to keep those levels topped up. Um, women who've had a complete surgical menopause, which means ovaries removed um, completely, so, um, often need higher doses as well. So it all depends on the individual story, um, perhaps the age of the patient, how their skin's absorbing. Um, and that is the beauty of regulated body identical because there's no one size fits all. Like with a pill, you've probably got a choice of two doses and that is your lot. With this way of this regulated superior gold standard type of HRT, we can titrate the dose to the individual um, to get the dose that controls symptoms and protects their future health. So it will vary. Um, the guidelines in the BNF, as our, uh, that's our Bible as, as GPs, we open it up and look at the doses and what it's been licensed for is outdated actually. So that it may say maximum the maximum needs to be get, got rid of. There's no such thing really um, because of this variation, especially with transdermal um, estrogen. Um, and, 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 that, and that basis, the maximum of four pumps or 100 micrograms, I think it says, it was really based um, back in the day when we thought it was all about sweats and flushes and often based on much older women whose requirements are less as we 
previously said in the in the talk, our requirements do go down with age. So it's based on that, which really has little relevance to a woman who's 38 and just had her ovaries removed, who will need much higher doses. So um, that message needs to get out to, to healthcare professionals and, um, and, and understand that it is safe to take higher doses. And often that's corroborated by a nice normal estrogen level and symptoms being under control. That's really helpful. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you both talked about symptom control. And um, that's such an important thing of women being able to track their own symptoms. And we've got a very powerful tool for that with the Balance app. Yeah. They can use the app to track their own symptoms and that really helps the health professional too. So in a way, it's really alluding to HRT needs to be treated like any other hormone treatment and started and monitored. So one of the themes that we've got coming through is um, if HRT started, and then in the time that we're living in currently, Louise, if I can come to yourself, with COVID concerns, um, one of the questions that got a lot of votes was when I had my COVID vaccine, the nurse was quite alarmed that I was on HRT patches. Is there any concerns in that to yourself or any advice for that? No, I mean, there's, there's really two things to mention here. Firstly, some people worry about the clot risk because there's been a lot of talk, hasn't there, about a clot risk of vaccine. Um, and then people think, oh, if I'm on HRT, is there a problem? So the most important thing really to know is that if women have estrogen through the skin as a patch gel or spray, it goes straight through the skin into the bloodstream, which bypasses the liver, which produces our clotting factors. So it works very differently to a tablet estrogen. Tablet estrogen, and it's the same with the contraceptive pill as well, actually can stimulate the liver producing the clotting factors. So there is a risk of clot with that type. But if the tablet estrogen is avoided, so the estrogen is through the skin, the tablet or the capsule progesterone that Rebecca talked about, the natural body identical progesterone, in the UK it's called Utrogestan, is taken orally, but it doesn't have this effect on the clotting factors, so there isn't a risk of clot. So it's very safe. A testosterone as well through the skin as a, as a cream or gel does not have a risk of clot. So that's one thing that's really important. There have been a lot of reports of people finding that their periods are changing quite soon after the COVID vaccine. And also, even with a COVID infection, a lot of women are noticing their periods are changing. There's some more research being done in this area, and we don't know whether having the uh, having the infection can alter the way our ovaries work. And any infection actually can affect ovaries. So it is likely to have an effect, but also the coronavirus is very specific on a, um, a specific receptor called the ACE2, the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, and we have a lot of those receptors in our ovaries. So it's likely that we have a double whammy when we've had COVID in that we've had an infection which can affect our ovaries and we've had an infection specific for affecting our ovaries even more. So I think some women are experiencing worsening perimenopausal and menopausal symptoms. But actually those women can still take HRT because of the other benefits it affords. So if women have had COVID or even the vaccine and finding that they're menopausal symptoms are worsening, they could start HRT. If they're on HRT already, their dose might need changing. But even women who haven't had the vaccine or a COVID infection often find their dose needs changing with time. So it's not a fixed dose. And we see that a lot with people with diabetes, their, their requirements for insulin change. Women with an underactive thyroid gland often need different doses of thyroxine. It's no different here, actually. It's just another hormone. And so a lot of people say, oh, my HRT doesn't work for me. I'm going to stop it. Well, that type of HRT isn't working for them because they're getting symptoms. But then we need to look at changing it. And sometimes, as Rebecca said, it's not even the estrogen. It might be the progesterone that needs changing. So if you get breast tenderness or bleeding, it might be the progesterone needs changing. The estrogen dose might need increasing or decreasing, or women might need to consider testosterone. So it's really important that people are given individualized advice, actually, and that's something that's really clear in the menopause guidance talking about that, because we're all different, so we need to be treated differently. Oh, absolutely. That's just so, so important. And actually, it overlaps nicely with uh, women who have other conditions as well as menopause. So we've had a, um, several questions about um, other medical conditions. And one of the themes that comes through is fibroids. 
So Rebecca, if I can come to you. Yeah. There are both aspects actually. A woman, women asking if I have fibroids, can I have HRT? And will they get bigger? And will they be affected by fibroids um, being there? And also, if I'm taking HRT, am I more likely to get fibroid problems? Yes, it's a common common question, isn't it? Um, yes, you can have HRT is the, short, is the quick answer if you have fibroids. Um, I think the confusion arises because uh, when we lose hormones in the menopause, if you do have fibroids, they will, like the uterus and the ovaries, shrink away and go and, and, and not cause a problem. But uh, the problem is, of course, you are menopausal and your hormones are, are, are low. So replacing with HRT means that the fibroids probably won't shrink away like they would if you didn't have any HRT. However, um, when we balance the hormones between the each and the progesterone, that can often um, just stabilize the heavy bleeding a woman may have, have gotten um, with, the, with the fibroids. Um, and really, there's not much evidence that they're going to grow dramatically possibly some people that may get they may get a little bigger but it's nothing very very dramatic um, and that can be managed because um, if that does happen you know heavy bleeding the marina coil is excellent at stopping heavy bleeding and a good treatment really option for people with fibroids um, but often fibroids come to light they're very mm -hmm. common and many people have them don't even realize they've got them but they come to light in the perimenopause as we have hormones going up and down um, and that can cause very heavy bleeding um, but just simply the act of balancing the hormones uh, with HRT replacing it so it's a much smoother um, level of hormones in our bodies can actually stabilize the bleeding and a lot of women have had very heavy bleeding with their fibroids and it may just by hormones alone uh, be balanced and, and become lighter but there are lots of options like the marina coil we can monitor things if things you know if there was a change um, but certainly uh, it's, it's safe to take HRT with fibroids and no um, it, HRT can't cause a fibroid um, they're, 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 they're there anyway does that answer that Yes, thank you so much. I mean, it's amazing the amount of times even I, in general practice, will hear that HRT will make fibroids worse. Mm. It's really important to clear up that misconception because it just really puts a lot of women off. Yeah. Um, brilliant. One of the things that we, we've, we've, you both touched on breast cancer and reassured us in that respect is a really important question that's come through about endometrial cancer. So it's a cancer we don't mentioned that much in relation to HRT, particularly if, like the, the lady who's asked the question, she's had a hysterectomy and her ovaries removed, a nephrectomy for treatment, and it was curative. And um, several years, over a decade later, she's been declined HRT. In your experience, Louise, what would you advise to this particular lady? It's very difficult, actually, for women who've had cancer, any type of cancer, actually, because a lot of women are denied HRT. And I think it's because people always think HRT is associated with cancer, but as we've already heard, it's not actually. So when you look at evidence, it's quite hard sometimes because the studies haven't been done, but in general, and I have to talk very generally, I can't give individualized advice here on a webinar, but in general, women who've had cancer, especially cancer that isn't an estrogen receptor positive cancer, can take HRT. There isn't any evidence that it will make it worse actually. And so um, endometrial cancer usually isn't a hormone sensitive cancer. And endometrial cancer is usually a very treatable disease. This lady's obviously had her operation 10 years ago, so she's really cured. Um, so once the cancer's removed, then usually women can take HRT. There are some types of endometrial cancer that you might not want to give straight away, but with the, with the time, it makes it less likely that there's any problems. Um, we can never say never in medicine. So that means we can never say something is 100% safe, but we can also never say something is 100% dangerous. So what we do is we weigh up risks and benefits, and it's exactly the same as when we get into our car or when we cross the road. We look and decide, is the benefit more than the risk? Do I want to get to the other side of the road? Do I want to complete my journey? Or am I worried I'm going to have a crash? And HRT is a bit like this. And it's, it's too easy just to say no because you've had cancer or because you've had breast cancer. Now, what we have to do is look at the evidence, 
look at any harms and then also look at the benefits as well. And so that's why most women can take HRT because of the overall health benefits. Now, with breast cancer, it can be quite difficult to certainly individualise. Um, but as a sort of general rule, if a woman's had an oestrogen receptor negative breast cancer, they can usually very safely take HRT, the same as women who haven't had any, any cancer. Women who've had an oestrogen receptor positive cancer, then it's very individualised and people should see a specialist. But there isn't any evidence that HRT is actually harmful for those women as well. And there is a booklet actually, I've got it here, you can see the cover, which is called Been Through Breast Cancer, Did Someone Mention Menopause? A, a Guide to All Things Menopause for Women After Breast Cancer. And so this is written on the Menopause Doctor website, um, but it, it's freely available for anyone to download and look, and it's quite detailed, but it will just talk about ways of managing the menopause, treatment options, how to talk to your doctor. The other thing is we've talked a few times already tonight about vaginal dryness or GSM, genital urinary syndrome with the menopause. So if a woman's having vaginal dryness, soreness, discomfort, Rebecca's already said some people not being able to sit down or wear underclothes very easily, urinary infect infections, urinary symptoms that have been constant leakage, then those local symptoms can be very effectively treated as Rebecca said with vaginal oestrogen. Now that's not HRT, it doesn't get into the bloodstream, so it doesn't have the same risks, it only works locally. So that means that women who've had any type of cancer actually, whether it's a, a, a breast cancer that's oestrogen receptor positive or whether it's a brain tumour, those women can still safely use vaginal oestrogen. And that's very important because a lot of women who've had breast cancer are told you can never have hormones. And there are different types of hormones, but certainly vaginal oestrogen is generally very safe for women who've had any type of cancer, including breast cancer. HRT, so the, the gel, the cream, the patches, the, the progesterone, often can still be given to some women who've had estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, but it really then depends on the history of that woman and you need to see a specialist for that. But you can never accept no, because some women actually say, I want that risk even if it's really high because living isn't just existing. I really want to um, get the most out of my life and I want to reduce my risk of heart disease and osteoporosis, for example. So it, it's just really important that we make the decisions ourselves in conjunction with a specialist. Uh, collaborating with them and making a shared decision is such an important thing in, in HRT and menopause care, isn't it? It comes across. The other tricky area, Rebecca, if I can come to you in terms of collaborating with a specialist is testosterone. Yeah. Because as you explained so clearly, its benefits and um, the license difficulties we have in, in, in our country in terms of in the UK for not having a licensed product for women. One of the things that um, questions have come in about is whether when should you start testosterone and do you need testing before you start it and how do you get your healthcare prescribing professional to start to entertain prescribing it. That was the word used. Right, so yes, well, let's start off with when would you want to use it or think about using it? So uh, remember what we said that testosterone is an important female hormone. The ovary produces more testosterone than estrogen. So it's not just a hormone for men. And it is very important for some women, especially for their uh, mood, their sleep, their memory, their concentration, the fatigue. They get up and go, their joie de vivre, their motivation, uh, concentration, that sort of feeling, um, as well as libido. It can help in all those domains. But also some evidence coming through that it can help as well. Uh, or definitely we know that it can help bone density and muscle pains as well. So it has many, many benefits for some women. And I think I'd always be thinking about testosterone um, in a woman who is established on HRT and still has these symptoms present. Um, I'd be thinking about testosterone in the young woman anyway. Um, regardless, because as we said earlier, they really do rely on their testosterone a lot. Um, and we've all had testosterone all our lives. Um, 
and also the woman who's had the the ovaries removed uh, especially but any woman can potentially benefit if they're suffering from those symptoms it's symptom led again we're coming back to symptoms again those symptoms i've just mentioned the mood concentration memory fatigue libido sleep um all um can respond very well to testosterone replacement so i think if those are so we need to discuss that um um, being off license, as Louise mentioned earlier, doesn't mean to say it's dangerous. It just means that the drug company haven't had chance to get or haven't applied for a license in that particular area. Um, um, so, you know, amitriptyline is a common antidepressant, it's low dose we use for pain relief. Um, and uh, many, many painkillers or psychiatric medications are, are off license, but have a great use because we know they're safe. Um, so that's really the off license that's not necessarily that but that's the problem it's it's understanding what testosterone is understanding for the women that they're not going to change into a into a man or um you know grow a beard or anything awful like that i say to i say to women starting it to, to, to get that, to, 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 to get a beard or get a deep voice, you'd need 10 times the dose for many, 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 many months, potentially, if, if that could ever happen. Um, and that, you know, you, you, you know, that would never happen because it's, it's so ridiculous. So we give the appropriate dose. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's the key is to, to break the taboo about testosterone, healthcare professionals and, and women. And then, this is this is more the problem is is the healthcare professionals in, in the NHS really haven't had much experience about prescribing testosterone haven't been taught about it. So the in the NHS, it can be prescribed, um, you may have a, a GP who has a great interest in the menopause and is happy to prescribe it. We do recommend some blood monitoring that goes along with that to monitor our um, free testosterone, which is um, the testosterone that's active in the in the bloodstream from time to time, um, and you know should be monitored and, and be prescribed by someone who understands it and 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 can can prescribe feels confident in prescribing it. But NHS menopause clinics should all be able to prescribe that. Um, seeing a menopause specialist in the NHS uh, would be a way to, to, to get that type of testosterone. And of course, um, we know the charity there, uh, we're trying to educate healthcare professionals in general about the use of testosterone and increase understanding because this hasn't been done before. So how on earth should they know really? Um, so we're really trying to rectify that, that knowledge gap um and 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 improve life for women so that they can hopefully in the future obtain it with with more ease um but it, at the moment sometimes you may go to your gp and they may not understand about testosterone which we we can understand and we're trying to do something about that but then you can ask can i be please be referred to an nhs menopause clinic because i think i i would really benefit i've done my reading about it from the menopause doctor website for example i really think this is what i'm deficient in still um so that's how i would 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 go about it if your own uh, healthcare practitioner can't prescribe it or doesn't understand about how to use it properly. That's really helpful. Thank you, Rebecca. I mean, it really leads to how important the charities and um, campaign and vision really is. And we all really need support for that. And, you know, one of the things we really need to keep the charity sustained is uh, donations. And so, you know, if you're listening in and you've tuned in and found this very informative and helpful, and many of you have left comments to say that you have, and we're thrilled for that, but we do ask that you support the charity and follow us and support our campaign, but also donate because we do need that to keep this movement going. We've started off on a really strong foot with all the education support we're offering health professionals, but to keep that sustained, we do need to move forward and have donations. So if you're doing something sponsored, please think about supporting the charity. And if you can, whatever you can give, no amount is too small, it'll all be helpful. Thank you both so much. I think the questions are piling in and we could be here till a Monday, but we have to say we covered so much and um, we've, we've covered the whole spectrum of menopause care and perimenopause care in terms of treatment too. And you've both been incredibly versatile in answering the questions and giving all the information back. I'd like to thank the team who've been involved in the back of supporting us tonight, Dr. Sarah Bull, Lucy Chatwin and Shona Khan who have been back trying to so filter everything and making it all work so smoothly as well as organizing it thank you all and thank you to both of you 
for being here. It's really amazing to see your insights and have tap into your knowledge. I know there's been a lot of comments from women that um, I wish I could share with you individually, but there's too many just to say how helpful this has been. Thank you. I'd just like to say thank you to you, Ritika, as well. So Ritika and I have never actually met in real life. It's really weird to believe that. But we've sort of been engaging for um, over a year now. And it's really been lovely working with Ritika on the charity. Um, I hope she doesn't mind me saying, but neither of us have any charity experience at all. But we both felt really strongly. And Rebecca, although she's not a trustee, has been involved in every sort of micro move of the, the charity because it's been no mean feat getting it launched, but now we feel it's the beginning of a really exciting but quite scary journey, actually. But what we want to do is to be a voice for women. Um, we really feel that women have just been neglected for too long, especially menopausal and perimenopausal women. And we need to change it, not just for us, but for our future generations as well. And we would love, actually, the menopause charity to be so successful that it chooses because there isn't such a thing as a menopause that is affecting people so adversely. That's meaning that women so often are giving up their jobs, they're losing their partners, they're really struggling because no one's been helping. So as a charity, we want to listen, we want to help, but we would like to close it as well. So if you could make it really successful, we can have this weird thing that hopefully in, in future years we don't need it but at the moment we really need it and I have been quite overwhelmed this week with the response from the program on channel four with the support from the charity but I've also been quite overwhelmed with the healthcare professionals real appetite to improve their own education and you know we've had thousands of healthcare professionals signing up for the course and they're not doing it because they want to tick a box. They're doing it because they want to help more women as well. And so we've got so much more that we want to do. So I really hope that we can do future webinars and tell you some good news about what the charity can do with your support and help and hopefully generosity. It will make a real difference. But, but thank you, Matika, for chairing so well because you know we've had 200 and oh, over 300 questions and I've been... Whenever I put my glasses on, I've been typing and, and responding, but there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of people needing help. So I hope today's been really helpful. And if you've got any feedback, please email the charity through the website and just let us know things that you liked about tonight, any ideas that you have, because we're here to listen and help shape the charity going forward. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Louise. Rebecca, would you like to say anything? No, just just that I'm so hugely excited to be involved with the, with the charity as a, as a medical advisor. And I think we can really achieve great things. Um, the, the conversation has been started. There's enormous momentum. Louise has made a massive change. The way we look at menopause over the last few years has worked tirelessly. And I think the fruits of her labour are starting to show now. We want to change the, the environment for women. So as Louise says, that they seamlessly progress into menopause and it's managed properly um, and you know distress um, which we see unfortunately a lot of is, is, is a thing of the past women can continue with their jobs their relationships and it's the work of the charity that can do this um, it can really make a difference so it'd be wonderful if people could be an early uh, adopter of the charity and supporter of the charity because they're here to make history because it really will change um, the whole um whole environment for women and society it is enormous and so it's hugely exciting and i've been delighted to be here today and i hope what we said talked about today was helpful um, and thank you radika for, for hosting so well brilliantly thank done you very much for, for being here both of you i mean even if someone's watching this on record the donations will be open they can support at any time and our aim is to reach women of any 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 group any language and get the information out as far as we can to, to all groups of women. So support us doing that and we can improve lives all together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Care. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody. Bye-bye.